Welcome everybody. I'm sure you can, hopefully you can hear us. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us this morning. Sorry, you have to excuse me. I've had a bit of a, a, bit of a cold. <laughs> Probably something not, not 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 something to publicize too too loudly while we lock down here in, in in Australia, um. But anyway, so I just wanted to say welcome to everyone. Uh, Derek, our CEO, will just give a brief introduction, and then we'll um we'll, we'll get going on the conversation with uh, with our guest Henry. So welcome everybody to our seventh series of webinars. Our webinars are designed to have experts speaking on a particular space within this. Uh, blockchain economy, portal asset management are passionate about um, the, the space, um, education, uh, sharing it with our followers, and, uh, and we thoroughly enjoy doing these. We also do blockchain breakfasts on a monthly basis. As part of our communication, we communicate out every month through a newsletter, and we do quarterly, annual, and quarterly half yearly, and annual reports on the industry that we communicate out to our some 3,000 followers. Portal Digital Fund is a multi-manager, multi-strategy fund that invests across the digital space. Um, in July, we will have invested in eight funds and 40 strategies covering both broadly the DeFi sector of some 30%, market neutral of some 30%, and sentiment and momentum of some 30% of how the the fund is based in the Cayman Islands. Uh, the fund manager is based out of Singapore, first degree global asset management. We are the sponsor to the fund and the advisor to the fund manager. Uh, we operate to institutional standards and our intention is to make sure that we both generate return out of volatility, but at the same time, we reduce volatility for our investors. And this can be reflected in these numbers sitting here. So last month was a month that during that period of time, the market turned down nearly 35%. And as you can see here, we were down 8.3%. So true to our strategy, we were a beta of 0.21. So we're very pleased with that. So we have some uh, 11 and a bit million funds under management, US dollars uh, to date. And we'd expect that to meet or exceed 20 million US by the end of this year. And just a quick makeup of that, about probably 95% of our investors are family offices. Over to you, Mark. Sorry, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Derek. So I think over the past, um, the past two months, we've seen quite a big uh, shift in, in, the, in the crypto space. Um, a lot of the headlines that have come out have unfortunately been um, you know, negative, particularly around, around China's moves on, on, on focusing on Bitcoin miners. And we'll talk all about that. I think, you know, our view is, you know, nothing moves up in a straight line. Nature doesn't work like that. Markets definitely don't work like that. You know, there's been a lot of very positive developments and a lot of very smart money that has a much longer term perspective um, that doesn't invest for the sort of the knee jerk reaction of where the market's going to be in a month or two. But money that's been put to work by what we perceive as very smart money managers and very smart investors with, you know, a two to three to even a five year time horizon. So, you know, some of the biggest and smartest money managers in the world, from Carl Icahn to Ray Dalio um, to, you know, Brevin Howard, are, are moving into the space. And I think the space is becoming more formalized and more institutional. So as much as there's been some, some challenging headlines, you can take a look um, over the past six months, since the end of last year, um, you know, the overall tone from the, the largest banks, the payment processes, has been very positive. You know, Morgan Stanley starting to offer it to their clients, Goldman's. So there's there's definitely an institutional adoption. If you take a look at the retail side, it is becoming more and more acceptable as a you know not just as a store of value, but it will you know as time goes on. Never mind what's happening in in, in El Salvador with the um, <clears throat> with the fact that it stands next to the U.S. dollar now as 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 a um, as a currency. You know, it's, it's also having ripples within both the, the retail and industrial space, the hospitality space. So we believe that, you know, fundamentally this, this, the, the thematic and, and structural bull market is, you know, well entrenched. It's still very much in place. We think that the, the outlook for the space is, you know, a lot more positive than it was two years ago. When people didn't really understand the implications of, of DeFi, when people hadn't heard of things like NFTs. And then, you know, just anecdotally, <clears throat> when we saw the, 
the risk off in February last year, everyone took a step back and pulled capital off the table. And this was very much true in the VC and private equity space, where the capital is being allocated to very liquid projects that, that make it riskier. That started returning in August, September last year, when people started realizing that the world is, is not going to come to an end and we, you know, there, there's unlimited QE. And we saw a lot of money being invested into the, into the VC space and into new tokens and into new, new projects. But there's a lead and lag of between you know, nine to 18 months before you'll see the fruition of those tokens and projects. And that we perceive will be in quarter four this year and the beginning of next year. There's gonna be a lot of new product coming to market. There's gonna be a lot of new and very exciting projects coming to market. So I think the genie's out the bottle. And I don't think that you know, in any way, shape or form, the, the, the headlines, the potentially negative headlines, which by the way, if you read into them, often the way the media portrays them is not exactly what was said. A lot of it has just been repetitive and is now just you know, looking to sensationalize some of it. So my final quick view on this is that we always, underestimate what we can do in a decade with our lives and with technology, but we overestimate what we can do in a year. And we get very much excited about something. And we saw the first wave in the ICO space and then that's, that's played out. And now we're seeing, I think, you know, we're, we're in, we're in, I still believe we're in the first wave. We're seeing wave two, but I think that we need to understand that when you have what, what they call a Cambrian explosion, you can't really predict where it's going to land. You can't really predict what the applications are going to be. The next unicorns, the next businesses that are going to dominate and disintermediate are going to be in the space. And just from a technical perspective, you know, if you bought Amazon when it listed in 97, you would have done really well into 99. And then you would have been, you know, crying all the way through to 2001. But if you took a long-term view, you know, yes, you would have gone sideways to a certain extent, but once the adoption and the tipping point came, once mobile technology and, and e-commerce and payment processes caught up, you know, you, you can see what the value creation was. So that's pretty much <clears throat> all I have to say. So we, we, we're very pleased to, um, to welcome Henry at this point in time. Unfortunately, he is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he's in lockdown um, in, in, in Hong Kong at the moment. So Henry is currently Henry is currently the, um, the, the PwC crypto leader. He's a, a best-selling author. Um, he's been a keynote speaker. We met at the Asian Financial Forum uh, just over a year and a bit ago, and we were very impressed with Henry's acumen and his, his understanding of the space. He has a broad, broad industry knowledge. He's also the um, adjunct university professor in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, He's basically, I would say, in my opinion, one of the leading experts in the space in terms of his ability to, to synthesize all the you know, really big headlines and understand what the implications are for the industry. So we're very pleased to, to have you on here today, Henry. Yeah, thank you for having me, Mark. And thank you, everybody at the Portal family. And thank you, everybody who listened to this from home in lockdown, Australia, wherever, wherever you're in the world. Uh, thanks. I know you have the choice of what to listen to. So thanks for coming and allowing us to share our passion uh, for the future of money, future of crypto. Yeah, Mark, as you mentioned, I'm actually, uh, I just landed in Hong Kong about a week ago and here this mandatory quarantine. They give you a monitoring bracelet. Although I'm completely vaccinated, although I test negative, I come from a low risk country. Uh, you're, they put you in a hotel room. And if you leave the room, it's six months in prison. Actually, the hotel I'm in has sent 10 people to prison the last month. So it's uh, it's kind of, uh, it is what it is. The, the good thing is the crypto world does not stop. So it always moves forward from that perspective. Uh, so that is, that is, it keeps us busy. As you mentioned, I mean, my day job, I wear many hats is I'm a PwC global crypto leader. Uh, so, I mean, we have a, to pivot a background. We've done over uh, 400 crypto engagements in the last 36 months. Uh, we have a team of, uh, in, of over 200 people across 20 countries. It's complete business that I set up from scratch, literally teaching people what was Bitcoin to now what it is. Uh, but also, as you mentioned, I, I teach a lot in university. I've been teaching in crypto in university now since 2015. Uh, actually, in my last book, The Future of Money, it was a global bestseller, as you mentioned. My next book, actually coming out later this year, 100% focus on crypto. It's about 400 pages, literally gives you a, a, the rundown of crypto industry. So uh, I'm finalizing right now, actually, as we are in quarantine. Uh, and obviously, I think many people know me via my social media videos uh, that have obviously uh, gained quite a lot of uh, traction. But also, I do a lot of policy work. I sit in numerous advisory boards of many central bank, many regulators around the world. Uh, I spend about 25% of my time with governments and regulators uh, and law enforcement. 
enforcement on various similar activities. Um, we're very excited to share, I, I think, uh, to echo some of the words you're mentioning, this is by far the most exciting time in the history of money. I really believe our kids, our grandchildren will look back at the period we're in right now. That started two years ago, actually almost two years ago, day, day to day, when uh, Facebook announced uh, Libra uh, to obviously, ironically, COVID pandemic that really accelerates some of the changes that we are seeing right now. And I think we had in two years what normally would have taken a decade. Uh, and really what we are seeing live now as we speak is completely game changing. Some of the things you mentioned in your presentation, like El Salvador making a legal tender. We came close to 2017 when Japan recognized it as a form of payment. And that's already game, uh, game changing moment to some of the entry we're seeing right now, institutional investors, some of the, the financial institutions entering the space. I think this is a really, really fascinating area, especially with some of the really cutting edge area works coming in, especially on DeFi. Again, we could talk about all those topics today. You know, for example, today, 10% of trading activity is happening on DeFi, 10%, you know? For, and I have to say, I was the first one to believe about a year, year and a half ago. I mean, to put things in perspective, in, in January 1, 2020, there was only a billion dollars in value locked in DeFi, only a billion dollars. And now we're over $60 billion, right? Uh, so I really, I have to say, I, I really underestimated the speed and interest of institutional investors and financial institutions looking at DeFi. And now obviously we're seeing a lot of activity in this space. So a lot of changes going on and look forward to sharing with this with you all today. And again, thanks again for the invitation and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Should we maybe just, you know, talk about the, the so-called elephant in the room and, and discuss, you know, China's increasing, it seems animosity towards the space. Yep. And then, you know, how that, I, I personally believe it's a positive. I think it'll, it'll help green the, the, the way mining is done. A lot of the miners are moving to Texas where you know, energy is, is, is sometimes goes negative. But just yep. your, your views on, on this kind of sure. this geopolitical struggle. Yeah, obviously, China, when it comes to crypto, uh, of course, buying and selling cryptocurrencies, fiat to crypto on ramps are illegal in China. But of course, China has been a dominant player, especially when it comes to Bitcoin mining. As I say, China, obviously, I live in Hong Kong. I used to live in China. I actually, uh, I speak Chinese. I did a master's in Chinese law. I, I'm a lawyer and a banker by background. And uh, I was actually the first Canadian to get a, such a degree years, years ago. So obviously, I've been very close to what's happened happening in China, especially on crypto. Uh, what has been really remarkable is I think from a Bitcoin mining perspective, uh, today, until two, three weeks ago, 65% of Bitcoin mining happened in China. Actually, 90% of that happens in, in Sichuan province, uh, followed by, by some in Xinjiang and what we call Dongbei in Chinese, like the, the northeast part of the country. Uh, really, I think what's been remarkable the last couple of weeks is that there was a lot of flags that this was going to happen. A uh, good indication about six to eight weeks before, there was an academic paper. You know, I'm a, being a professor, I'm, I'm a nerd. I read a lot of academic papers, especially on crypto. And uh, on Nature magazine, that was really... Uh, by a bunch of uh, academics that were actually basically saying if China continues with its Bitcoin mining, uh, it may actually miss its Paris Climate Accord targets. And uh, it's, it was basically pretty much the, the writing was on the wall uh, from that perspective. Uh, and actually what we've seen uh, subsequently uh, was obviously some kind of two events happened. One, there was three trade associations in China that put a warning together, uh, mentioning that obviously Bitcoin has no value. It's not protected by Chinese law. And that was followed uh, a couple, four or five days later by the state councils, uh, what they call the FSDC uh, department, actually making a very uh, clear, uh, basically, ban on Bitcoin mining. Since this has happened, really, we've seen really a couple of things happen. One of them is literally, physically, we are seeing Bitcoin miners send the Bitcoin mining machines uh, overseas. I mean, literally, we're probably having the biggest migration of, of mining machines right now happening. And uh, like you mentioned, Mark, they're really going to a couple of places. Uh, first of all, they're going to the U.S., but also they're going to Russia. And actually, they're going to Kazakhstan as well. Uh, right now, if you look at the order uh, part of China, uh, these two countries, uh, uh, the U.S., Russia and Kazakhstan are number two, three, four when it comes to mining. And some of the countries have been really positioning themselves to welcome them. Uh, you mentioned the state of Texas. Believe it or not, it was one or two weeks ago. Uh, there was a mining conference in, in China, and the, the governor of the state of Texas was giving a speech welcoming these Chinese miners to the state of Texas. Uh, and same thing happened in Kazakhstan, by the way, which has very good laws and regulations on uh, crypto mining. So we're definitely, definitely seeing this. If I was a betting man, I would say that in the next 12 months, uh, probably the country that will have the majority of the mining activity will actually probably be the United States, uh, which is very ironic because today many people in the crypto world complain, say, ah, oh, 
China has the majority of the mining. Ah, this is centralization of mining activity. I'll be very interested to see if the, how that uh, conversation occurs when the majority is in the US or in Russia or in Kazakhstan uh, in the next year. So again, it is what it is. We'll see what happens there. I think the one thing, I think the biggest misconception right now though, uh, Mark, I think it's very important to mention is that uh, this whole debate about the environmental impact of Bitcoin. Actually, on my next book, I have about 40, 50 pages on this exact topic because I think there's unfortunately, uh, this debate gets a lot of media headlines, especially places like Australia, Europe, where obviously ESG is and should be a priority. Uh, but unfortunately, we often focus on the headlines. I mean, I think there's two things to understand here. Uh, one of them, yes, Bitcoin is not a green asset like anything else. Uh, it's not. It's not a naturally. It's not a. You know, we're not. Um, it's not a green asset. However, I think we have to be very careful how we look at the debate. Uh, first of all, I think there's a lot of things to consider, right? Uh, for example, one thing I think of the debate that is not often uh, uh, discussed is why we need this Bitcoin mining is because of the decentralized nature of Bitcoin. You know, in academic terms, we call this the impossible trinity, where you cannot have scalability, security, uh, and decentralization at the same time. Your Visa network that we have for credit cards, for example, is very secure, it's, you know, but, but uh, it's, uh, it's also very scalable, but of course it's not decentralized. And Bitcoin just by its nature needs to have uh, the Bitcoin mining network that happens. However, uh, I think one thing we often do not talk about is the, some of the benefits that it can provide. For example, I'm a big believer that actually Bitcoin mining could be a catalyst to the development of renewable energies. And actually, this is one thing you'll see over the next couple of months as the industry moves to the US. Uh, for example, uh, today, the mining that happens in China, in Sichuan, for example, is actually very renewable. They're using hydroelectricity. The problem is during the dry season when they went to Xinjiang and other parts of the world that they were using coal. And that was actually the problematic part. Um, what you see as they go to, for example, right now, as they go into the U.S., for example, uh, in the U.S., in many parts of the United States right now, there's actually an excess of renewables. Uh, for example, there's a lot of solar, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, hydro, where actually it's going unused for very, very simple reasons. One of them is actually is when the demand happens. Uh, for example, like every normal human being, if you're working on a normal schedule, you consume a lot of electricity in the morning when you wake up. And actually at night when you're back home, when you're cooking, you're watching TV, you're watching the football game or whatever. Uh, but ironically, that is a time where there's the least renewable produced, you know, because obviously if you're solar at night, there's no renewable. And obviously when it comes to uh, wind, it's obviously very uh, variable. Uh, and of course, when we talk about a hydro, uh, many of cities and people, we actually live far from, from the source of the hydro. So what happens actually Bitcoin miners, because they can turn on and off these machines in theory, uh, they can be what they call the buyers of last resort. So during the times of when there's less demand on renewables, on the grid, these Bitcoin miners can be actually the buyer of last resort and actually make some of these renewable mining activities, uh, not only may help them to break even, but also make them uh, profitable. Um, the second thing as well is that these Bitcoin miners can pretty much go anywhere. You know, if you're in Sydney right now, uh, you know, people are not going to leave Sydney, go live next to the electrical, hydroelectrical dam just because electricity will be cheaper. Uh, but actually, the beauty of Bitcoin miners, they can go literally next to the source of the renewable energy and buy, buy this electricity that is often wasted, uh, that is often, often in excess. And again, it can make a lot of these projects more uh, renewable. So I think that's one of the things we don't talk about a lot uh, that I think I'm very uh, positive uh, on that perspective. And at the macro level as well, yes, we focus on Bitcoin mining, but as we all know, uh, many of the other cryptocurrencies in the market, uh, let's see, Ethereum is a good example. The second biggest cryptocurrency is moving from proof of work, which is the, what consumes electricity, to proof of stake, for example, over the next 24 months. And many of the other cryptocurrencies in the market are, are actually do not uh, use proof of work either. So I think there's a lot of these things that often we don't, um, we don't talk about, about the electricity debate. When it comes to the geopolitical element to it, I think it'll be very, very interesting to watch uh, the debate, what's going to happen. But I think it proves one more thing. And I'll stop it with this, Mark, is that it proved that despite the big changes going on, the, my, the ban of the Bitcoin mining activities in China, the migration we're having right now, record levels, by the way, the Bitcoin network is doing very well and shows, again, the strength of, the, of having a decentralized network as Bitcoin and what we were seeing today. Uh, for example, on Friday this week, we are going to see a historic day in the history of Bitcoin where we're seeing a 25% drop in a difficulty level. Um, I mean, to be a bit of a background, what this means is that the Satoshi Nakamoto in the genius that he or she or they uh, were or are uh, came up with a mechanism that uh, as uh, if more and more people are mining, 
And if there's what we call the hash rate, there's more and more people on the Bitcoin network, uh, the, the hash rate, which is obviously goes up, the difficulty level goes up as well, which makes it more difficult to find mine that block. And of course, with about 50% of global hash rate that probably went offline because of what happened in China, we're having a 25% drop of this difficulty level that is happening on Friday. It's probably going to happen Friday afternoon. Uh, and that is actually quite remarkable. Uh, today, uh, to give you an example, normally there should be a new Bitcoin block that is mined every 10 minutes. And that is actually pretty much the case. If you look at chart, uh, you know, it's pretty much that's where it's happening. Right now, the, the average Bitcoin block is being mined every 13.4 minutes. So from 10 minutes to 13.4. And again, the difficulty drop will again change this and we're going to go back closer to 10. So again, we're living a historical time. But again, this shows that the network works very well and that Bitcoin showed again its resiliency despite a black swan event that happened the last two weeks. Good. Could I bring in um, Nitin? I think it would be it would be good to get your your views, and um, particularly con considering you you live in Texas and could probably start a mining operation in, in your garage now. Um, but I'd be keen to get your views dealing with some of the the, the, the enterprises that you deal with. <clears throat> if you think, I mean, net net, I think it's great that the miners will be moving to to somewhat more liberal sort of democracies. Um, I don't know if you have any views on that, maybe. The, you know, absolutely. The I think the we had something called, you know, Snowid uh, a few weeks uh, back when we had this massive winter. I'm sure it's 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 well famous, and we had, you know, some failures in power grid. And it's interesting, Henry, because in context of Texas, and I'll, I'll I'll provide a perspective in terms of the U.S. context in general. Texas grid used to be an example that it's usually not part of. It's a truly lone star state when the Texas grid is not connected to the rest of the country, and it was supposed to be self-sufficient in terms of producing a combination of green energy, which is wind-based energy, and as well as you know, things that, that go. And I think some of the regulations that's been passed, both attracting miners, attracting the real estate is cheap, the talent is there, uh, and, and trying to, you know, most states, and I was actually a few weeks back, we spent some time in Wyoming, where Wyoming, Mississippi, Nebraska, Texas, they all got together in figuring out the elements around the three Cs, which is crypto, carbon, and cattle. Um, you know, has been an interesting sort of, you know, confluence of the, of, of how these states are trying to use this industry to be able to gain a competitive advantage and fuel economic powerhouses that they aspire to be. Though I did have a perspective on this where I think that this entire notion of ESG, which as you know, Henry, in our circles, has taken a massive momentum in investment circles, especially in this year going forward. Uh, it has become a you know, a, a issue with treasury, which means it's driven from overall treasury policies going all the way down to black rocks of the world in making decisions and figuring out quantification of ESG into every investment instruments and how it enters the gap in all the, you know, accounting standards. Though I don't know if, if Bitcoin alone is a trigger to, to green energy. I think in many cases, green energy should be an agenda that some total of all the financial systems, some total of all the things that we're doing is far greater than Bitcoin itself. The Bitcoin as a single sort of unit may be culpable for some of the energy you know, equation in terms of consumption, though I think that, that we should separate the two together in the sense that uh, it's still in its infancy. As you know, it's still, in my opinion, even though after 12 to 13 years, still an experiment which is maturing, um, whereas if you look at the existing financial systems that is responsible for payments and responsible for, you know, for movement of value, it's still consuming some total of lot, you know, a much larger you know, equation from an energy perspective. So just want to get your thoughts that is this, is it cause and effect or are they two parallel stream that eventually will converge say, you know, we need to work on green energy regardless for stuff for our homes, as you mentioned, in terms of what we consume. And if Bitcoin as the intelligent community, as a community that drives the entire crypto community in general, drives that whole momentum, will that solve the problem faster? And that's a debate that we've had again in Bitcoin conference and then, and in many of the internal circles, that if that helps reduce the overall ESG equation, uh, I think that it'll help the cause as opposed to blaming Bitcoin for energy per se. I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, good question, Nitin. I think the, the question on the ESG impact of Bitcoin mining will be closed in about 12 months. Yeah, uh, exactly. I think we're seeing today, to put, put, put a perspective about today, 72% uh, of miners today, this is before the migration from China, were using already renewables. And depending on the ratios data you look at, it's very difficult to get accurate data, but it's anywhere from 30 to 50% of 
of the electricity used for Bitcoin mining is already coming from renewables. With this migration out of out of uh, China, where actually there's obviously be less coal uh, uh, mining uh, uh, mining because of with coal and electricity, uh, the the renewable energy uh, debate will will will, will actually be. Address, but also I think we're not giving credit, as you mentioned, Nitin. There's been a lot of community ecosystem initiatives. I think I've been very impressed how the crypto community actually, in many regards, has come together as well to try to address this issue as well. Uh, there's, I, I mean, a lot of not only the miners are trying to promote this, and actually there's a lot of the initiatives by the crypto community to actually show uh, that actually the industry is is um, is doing a big focus on on renewables. And this is not only smoke and mirrors, by the way. There's actually genuine initiatives uh, going on from that perspective. That we show it. So I'm actually very confident. I actually think that this is a kind of a, a, a value a trade that can be done because as this issue settles down in the next 12 months, and then for a lot, of, especially a lot of the European other ESG uh, investors, where ESG is part of the investment process, this actually becomes a, another tick that can be ticked as well uh, that will be addressed from that perspective. Uh, so I'm actually very confident from that perspective. I think there's going to be some technical uh, things that need to be solved. I mean, a very good example is the way Bitcoin mining happens today. It happens by pools. So let's say if let's say uh, Nitin and I will want to start Bitcoin mining, we have our own rigs. It's great, but you know Nitin and I by ourselves. The chance that we get a lucky uh, block or minor block is actually quite quite small. What normally happens is you go within a pool. Uh, so you know we put our mining machines together as part of a bigger group, and that group then obviously um, will mine. And obviously the 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 the, the mining um, the, what we call the Coinbase actually the the the, the what we get at the six point twenty five Bitcoin plus the transaction fee you get every ten minutes is distributed among the people in that pool. And there's different mechanism how this works. Uh, so the problem will be how do you measure the ESG a greenness of a pool, because unless everybody in that pool is also mining in a green element, uh, using green uh, renewables, it's very difficult to measure. So I think there's some technical things that will that will be addressed, but these are all being addressed right now. So I'm actually quite optimistic on the uh, renewable uh, question. I think that uh, frankly, the crypto ecosystem was very naive for many years to actually not address this. Uh, uh, you know, I remember two, three years ago when we used to talk about this topic, uh, we'd say, no, 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 forget about this. Ah, you know, like you, you'd be brushed aside. By the way, in the same way, yeah, I remember five, six years ago, I used to be brushed aside when I used to talk about KYC and AML for crypto. Uh, so I'm happy this topic is there. I'm happy that we're addressing it like grownups and we're trying to proactive steps to deal with it. Uh, but I'm actually quite optimistic on the, this, how the way this is going to be dealt with uh, over the next couple of months. Good. So no, there's I, a question from David. Yeah, um, I, kind of, <clears throat> I try to answer it, but <clears throat> I, can, I can talk to it briefly. Um, his question is, you know, can you address the level of volatility we're seeing in our holders of crypto for the purpose of investment should reflect on the level of volatility versus the rewards? So just briefly in our road, our view is volatility is not risk. In this space, volatility due to the inefficiency in the market um, represents opportunity, particularly for the funds that we invest in, which tend for the most part, we have around 60% at this point of the funds in low vol, market neutral, high frequency trading arbitrage type strategies. So when the spreads open, they tend to do reasonably well. That being said, they low vol funds, so they're not aiming for you know, 10% a month, they're aiming for two or 3% with very low vol. If you're trading directly as a retail type investor, then you know the way to manage your risk, the main sources of risk in a fund are, are, are gearing or leverage, your net exposure to the market, and then your position sizing. And in times where the volatility is spiking, you shouldn't be running any of those. <clears throat> you should keep your position sizing small. You should keep your gearing below one. And, and I would say your net exposure, you know, try try keep to between 50 and 80%. When the market's firmly moving, you can take the other view. But I think we've taken a view that the volatility in the space is really high and will remain really high. So the way we take advantage of it is to diversify across a range of trading strategies, differentiated strategies. I think it would be good, Henry, you know, if I look back at the hedge fund space, in, in, in 2000 and, sorry, 1998, when you had the collapse of long-term capital management, it forced the industry to regulate and they regulated managers as well as the, 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 the structures. And people thought it was the end of the hedge fund space, but actually when the managers got pulled out of the dark into the light, they attracted massive inflows because all the institutions then started their own boutique fund of fund type products. Yep. It feels like we're in the early stages of that year too. Do you, do you have a view on the, the yep. fund funds in the this, in this space? Yep. Yeah, that's a great question, Mark. I think, I'm, I'm, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. The analogy of when LTCM happened in the 90s, and uh, actually, I always say we're in the crypto hedge fund industry right now, exactly where the traditional hedge fund industry was in the 1990s. If you give it a, give it a comparison as well, 
in a traditional hedge fund industry in the, in the late 1990s, there was about, less, about $180 billion in AUM. And today, like 20 or so plus years or so, we're about a $4 trillion industry, the traditional hedge fund industry. Uh, right now, again, to the, the total crypto hedge fund industry, I'm not talking about passive funds here or a VC funds, that hedge fund industry with some of the strategies you mentioned is according to our last PwC uh, survey around $3.8 billion. That's it. Uh, so if you think about it, if the industry, I mean, you can see the amount of growth that is going to come up over the next couple of years in this industry, uh, you know, so even if it becomes only 10% of the traditional hedge fund industry, that's still 100x growth that we'll, that we'll see in the crypto hedge fund industry. So I'm extremely bullish on that side. I think a couple of things that have been uh, happening is I think in, in the uh, couple of problems that I'm seeing right now in the, in the crypto hedge fund industry, as you mentioned, many majority of the funds right now actually are quant funds. As you mentioned, if you're a crypto quant fund today, Actually, regardless of markets move, as long as volatility and there's actually liquidity, it's great. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, but second, I would say manager selection becomes very important. Actually, this is why I always say we need fund the funds like yourselves who are there, uh, uh, you know, looking at doing DD. Actually, not a lot of more than investment due diligence, more on operational due diligence. Uh, I have to say, I spent many years myself as a hedge fund lawyer. I was in prime brokerage in many years in, in the consulting role as well. And I have to say where we are right now in the crypto hedge fund industry on the op operational due diligence perspective is really where we were like in the early 2000s yeah. where you know people were self-administrating people were cutting their own nav themselves um i mean thankfully i think the industry has, has, has evolved a lot I have to say the crypto hedge fund industry has evolved a lot very rapidly has learned a lot from what the traditional hedge fund industry is uh so I'm, i actually remain very very bullish i think as a uh, the next 15, 20 years, there'll be a lot of opportunities in the crypto hedge fund industry because the exact, exact same way that happened in the traditional space, a lot of institutions, uh, even families, uh, endowments, foundations, pensions, even bigger capital allocators, sovereigns and the likes will allocate to crypto hedge funds, learn about the industry, join the monthly calls, join the quarterly calls, learn about it. And eventually, 5, 10, 15 years later, they'll bring this expertise in-house. Today, most pension funds today have their own hedge fund desk, if you want, have their own piece, uh, PE groups, VC groups in a way, right? I think we'll see the same thing, but that's going to take 15, 20 years. So I remain very, very optimistic. And I think very, I think the crypto hedge funds have a big role to play in the further development of the crypto industry. Do you, do you have any views just on the question that I answered in terms of <clears throat> how you would manage the volatility in this space? <clears throat> I think some of the answers you give actually are very uh, spot on. I think the um, one thing uh, we, we see a lot of the allocators, if, for example, like some of the quant funds, for example, when you're looking at it, uh, the, uh, I mean, literally, uh, you know, whatever, how, whatever markets move is obviously a bit irrelevant. Uh, as long as there's the liquidity and there'll be, there's a volatility, they should generally perform uh, quite well. I think what's, what's becoming interesting on the um, uh, uh, leverage side, that's why I think having experienced folks within those funds that are no proper portfolio management and risk management becomes critical, yeah. especially when you talk about gearing the portfolio. Uh, unfortunately, what I see with a lot of the uh, young crypto hedge funds, well, obviously, uh, you know, it's very easy to make money in the bull market. It's great. Everybody is uh, thinking about Lamborghinis and going to the moon. Uh, but obviously, that's what the time markets turn around, that this actually is, these skill sets of how you're managing the book, how you're ma managing your leverage becomes very, very important. And actually, uh, I have to say more than that, it's also the, 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 your service providers as well. Huh? I mean, uh, I have to say, I've been very impressed. Uh, we've had two big crashes in the last year. You know, one was in March 2020. Uh, actually, when COVID was starting, there was a big, big market crash. And second was actually the last couple of weeks. Uh, what you see is despite the levels of gearing and leverage in the system, you know, uh, and there was we had we didn't have a run on the banks we didn't have a Lehman mo moment right mm -hmm. actually you'll see a lot of the these uh, the, there's a lot of crypto borrowing crypto lending happening in the market and actually a lot of these providers are actually quite well collateralized actually and I have to say I was very impressed to see how the ecosystem dealt with it I think the last two tests that we had in the last year have been good tests to show that at least from a counterparty risk management things were reasonably okay let's mm -hmm. not forget there's no isdas in crypto. By the way, it's something that still amazes me how we still don't have is the equivalence on derivatives. Uh, and uh, I think that's like, uh, for, uh, you know, we would need to solve that problem eventually. But I think the way a lot of the industry has been dealing with it, I think I've been quite, uh, I think I've been, uh, uh, I think it's been quite a positive. Uh, I, I think it'll come though, don't you think? I think the formalization is coming yeah. and you're seeing prime broking solutions being offered. You're seeing, you know, the, the, the biggest risk what keeps me, you know, awake is the operational side because yeah. the, you know, fraud is impossible to detect you know, upfront often. And that is the worry, you know. Um, I, I also do think though that as the industry starts formalizing, it's attracting 
a better quality of, of, of manager. You're starting to see less emphasis on pure quant trading strategies and more emphasis on building our teams and funds and understanding, particularly DeFi, because DeFi is not just, it's not just um, you know, a, a token to invest in as a store of value. DeFi is generating, <clears throat> in last month, I think in May, it generated, I think nearly $400 million in revenue. Right. So there's real valuation metrics now from a corporate finance or investment management point of view. You can do DCF analysis. You can look at networking effect. There's lots of ways, the, the traditional ways of valuing assets become you know, a bit more opaque in this space, but there is real cash being generated. These are real business models. I think that's what people don't understand. Maybe you want to just talk a little bit around DeFi and try and like sort of demystify it a bit. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, actually, let me, let me just take a step back on DeFi. I think the, what's important to understand with DeFi is obviously when I'm buying and selling, let's say, Bitcoin on Coinbase or Kraken or any other your favorite exchanges, obviously you, the asset is decentralized, but you're using centralized intermediaries to trade. And, and even when you talk about custodians, for example, we're using the traditional centralized intermediary models to trade these decentralized assets. What is really remarkable with DeFi or decentralized finance is really is basically the ability to conduct these financial transactions without any intermediaries. I mean, actually, and you may say, okay, what are, what are these transactions you can do? One of them is crypto trading, for example. As I mentioned uh, last month, for example, there was over $150 billion that was traded on DeFi exchanges, you know, on what we call DEXs. Uh, again, it's, it's a drop in the bucket if you compare. I mean, just by way of comparison, only crypto to crypto exchanges like fiat uh, centralized crypto to crypto exchanges had over 2 trillion last month traded. But again, $150 billion is, is not a small amount. Then you have, for example, stablecoin issuances. You know, uh, people, you can go get your USDC, but okay, we have issuing, issuing methodologies like DAI, for example, there's a couple of billion dollars there. But also now you can get uh, crypto asset management, for example, on, on DeFi platforms, even De uh, De uh, DeFi insurance. That is now available as well. And I think that's really remarkable what we're having. What I think, you know, uh, with DeFi, what I find fascinating is that uh, there's a couple of things. First of all, it allows us to have a first principle approach to financial services. Why is that? Because really DeFi has a couple uh, particularities. One of them is permissionless. Literally any one of us, regardless of where we're born, what passport we have, uh, what we are, we can actually use these DeFi platforms. So when it comes to being permissionless, it is generally permission. We talk about the regular touristers uh, subsequently, but I think what's really amazing is what we call the what we call the the composability. It's a bit like financial Legos. Today, for example, if there's two fintech apps that I love, you know, I love a certain app and I love another fintech app. I you know I cannot put them together. You know, they're all very privately held or they're very secretive of how the operations work. Yes, we've been trying to do open APIs and open banking initiatives across the world, including in Australia for many years, and it's been very difficult. However, with the beauty with DeFi, literally, if you and I, Mark, there's two applications on DeFi that we love, we can literally put them together, thus the term financial Lego, and come up with our own application on DeFi. It's all open source. So again, everybody can verify. And I think that is really allows you to really think how this first principle approach to DeFi. And because it's using smart contracts, there's no a centralized intermediary counterparty risk. Actually, the only risk you have is smart contract coding risk. But because it's open source and you have so many eyeballs looking at it, actually the risk de facto is actually quite uh, quite limited. So I think that's really, really mind blowing what's happening on the DeFi space. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I was particularly uh, uh, positively surprised of the levels of interest of uh, institutional players in DeFi. I thought this is something that was gonna stay in the geek world of our, our, all of us nerds in crypto. Uh, the, how the speed of how we went into the institutional world, I was very surprised. I have to say I'm the first one to, to admit it. Uh, second, I have to say I'm very impressed of the level of activity going on on DeFi platforms right now. Uh, you, and there's real revenues. You mentioned before, there's about, about this month uh, we're about to hit $400 million in revenue on DeFi platforms. I think it's really remarkable. The problem I think we have in DeFi right now is for the average user. I always give the example of my mom, my lovely mom in Montreal, Canada. Uh, there's no way she's going to be able to use a DeFi platform. Impossible. Uh, actually, a couple of years ago, I gave her a fraction of a Bitcoin because my mom never understood what I do in life. And now she actually, she's the Bitcoin expert with her, with her girlfriends. Uh, she's the one that calls customer support at these crypto places. Actually, not call because it doesn't exist. Emails all these customer support of all these crypto exchanges for her questions. Um, but she, there's no way she can use any of these DeFi platforms. I think what I'm really waiting to see now is how people are going to be able to transact on DeFi platforms without knowing they're using a DeFi platform. And that is going to be really remarkable, I think, over the next couple of months. So very, very excited. And I was very happy to see, uh, Mark, that you guys are looking at it very actively in the space. I think the there's uh, it's unfortunately an area that is very difficult, very complicated. 
And that's where you need some uh, people to spend some time looking at it. But I think that's tremendous opportunities. I'm actually surprised that uh, if I was today the CEO of a bank, of a traditional old school bank, you know, I would not only have a team looking at crypto strategy, but I would also have a separate team or potentially a, a sub, sub, uh, subsidiary of that team really looking at DeFi and understanding what is the impact on my business, on my PL over the next decade or two decades, and how I, what is the role I can play in that space. And I think that's one thing that is uh, uh, that I think if you're not as a financial institution looking at it, I think you should take a look at it as well. So, so Henry, just a, a question here around regulation. So, so putting a little bit of DeFi into context, you know, my, my research on it shows that DeFi's capitalization as of a few months ago, so the utility token capitalization of the DeFi sector was around $15 billion. Um, and in 2019, a survey was done with the banking industry and the insurance industry, how big it was worldwide, which was $90 trillion. So you've got this flea looking at this major marketplace. Um, and you can see the efficiencies occurring, you can see it rapidly growing and it's exciting. What do you think of that $90 trillion industry starting to try and muscle up and uh, protect its, its territory? Yeah, it's a good question, Derek. I think it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for a couple of reasons. And obviously in my role, I deal with many financial institutions entering the space, you know, like the whole gamut of financial institutions. I think there's a couple of, first of all, conceptual uh, changes, right? Obviously with DeFi, it's open source. So you have to operate in a space that actually you don't own the code. It's everybody can see it. And it really, it's basically, it changes the mindset of how you're operating. Second also is today, if you're a financial institution, if you're getting into DeFi, you need to have a long-term perspective. Unfortunately, what I see with many traditional financial institutions is very short term. As you guys know, the average length of uh, probably Australia is a bit of an exception there, but it obviously is only a couple of years. Uh, and you know, if today you're running a certain department of a bank, uh, frankly, yes, you can worry about crypto and you can even start worrying about DeFi, but by the time that really hits the PL on a meaningful level, you'll be you'll be a different bank already. You'll be somewhere else already. So I think there's actually a mismatch between the kind of the uh, the 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 impact it's going to have on a financial institutions where what actually matters for shareholders are holding it, and actually it's leadership that is obviously more short term. So I think there's a bit of a mismatch that I'm seeing there. Mm. Um, actually, you mentioned it's kind of a flea versus the the bigger beast. I don't think that the the bigger beast now realizes there's even a flea, frankly. I think we talk about DeFi in our crypto space and our crypto circles and people like everybody on this panel, on this uh, webcast today, where you're interested about this topic. Uh, but I would say if you ask today any uh, fine, uh, traditional banking executive, what is DeFi? I think and what is going to be the impact? I'd be surprised that you have a lot of people uh, answer it. Uh, I think, but it just is the, it's, it's been the case. I remember five, six years ago, uh, you know, uh, talking about FinTech, uh, people, half of the people I used to speak with at a bank thought FinTech was the name of a company. You know, so again, so I think we're going to have this over, over, over the next couple of years. It'll be, it'll be evolving. It'll become more mainstream. Um, what does it mean? I think on a, a practical level, I think there's a couple of challenges for DeFi as well. A part of the user interface, I think the other one is regulations. As you mentioned today, uh, you know, I think pretty much if you're using centralized exchanges, pretty much around the world, there's regulations around it. Uh, I mean, according to Cambridge University today, only 5% of regulators do not have somebody working on crypto. So you know, so I mean, just to put things in perspective, the FATF, right, the Financial Action Task Force, came out actually this week saying that out of their 120 or so member countries they have, 58 of them have already issued regulations on, on crypto exchange and crypto custodians. The term that we use in, the, in, that, in that sphere is called VASPs. And actually, out of the 58 who have come up with regulations, 52 have regulating crypto exchanges, and only six of them are banning them. So we're pretty much having, for crypto exchanges, crypto custodians, uh, regulatory clarity. We may, you may not love the rules, but they're there, right? So today, for example, if you're, you're uh, let's say you're a criminal, you're trying to launder money via, via crypto exchanges that are centralized, it's pretty much impossible. I mean, uh, you could maybe do small amounts and stuff, but a really meaningful amount is, is pretty much now uh, impossible. When it comes to DeFi, though, of course, DeFi is obviously completely unregulated today. And actually, I have to say, just if, if I put my lawyer hat on for a second, I think it's going to be very difficult to regulate DeFi, you know, because it's it's so conceptually different. How do you regulate something that is actually completely DeFi? It's like you tell me I have to regulate the oxygen in the air, you know? Yes, I can regulate the borders. I can regulate factories in a country, but I cannot regulate the oxygen in the air or the, the water in the ocean, you know, as it flows freely. So I think it's going to be very, very interesting to see how they're going to do it. Uh, the reality, though, is they will need to find a way uh, because or else it's a massive gap. Right now, if I'm a criminal, 
frankly, and I want to launder uh, dirty Bitcoin, you know, first of all, it's very difficult. But if I wanted to, uh, I would not even waste time on centralized exchange. I would go totally to DeFi. There's ways obviously not to track. So exchanges know when a coin is coming from DeFi uh, platforms, for example. Uh, but I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how that DeFi world now interacts with the uh, regulator and the regulators, the regulators, regulate, regulate, and regulatory authorities around the world. Uh, and I think that's going to be very interesting to watch uh, from that perspective. Yeah. So, so one comment on that, uh, Henry, I think that's spot on, right? I think your analogy of the Lego block, which is oftentimes what DeFi, you know, DeFi is compared with, where we can take all these services, combine them into any services that we like. We're not constrained with a structured product in a banking, for example, or going after uh, certain brokerage firms to access an asset. And it truly is a global platform in the sense that smart contracts and the DAOs, which represent these smart contracts as a, a DeFi asset class, yeah. sort of have truly democratized this whole thing that you have the same rules of engagement, in fact, uh, around the world. It's truly a global network that allows you to access this and buy and sell assets. The only thing that differs is the access point. So if you're in the Philippines, you may need a banking rail to move, and that's where you have the governance and some of the regulatory elements and moving the money into the DeFi space. So what we've been internally debating this whole element is, what if we could use a crypto only fungible asset. So Ether and Bitcoin, as you know, are very liquid assets in the crypto realm. Mm -hmm. And and we have been talking about global macro and, and I just wrote a piece of this today, which you, which you published in a week or so, where the complexity of the world we live in comes when we, when we try to merge the two realms, the crypto realm, which has own crypto macro elements with the global realm, which has own global macro elements. But what if I had Ether and that Ether would allow me to engage in the same transaction volume, the same transaction data, no matter where I'm in the world, the same asset class. I think there's a lot of power and a lot to unpack there, but I just want to get your thoughts of the world we live in where suddenly now these, while they make life easier, they also challenge the status quo of sovereign currency. And that makes an interesting shift in the way policies are crafted, right? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's a very, uh, we could have, I think, a two hour debate on this topic. And I think you're absolutely right. I think the, the, the first of all, on the, on the national level, you're right. The beauty of DeFi, it's anybody, when you're in the DeFi ecosystem, whether you're, you're in Sydney, you're in Moscow, you're in Buenos Aires, or you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, doesn't matter. You're trading on the same platform. I think that's kind of beautiful. I have to say, one thing I've had personal issues, uh, maybe it's the, you know, is that, you know, today, if let's say, you, you know, you're born in, in Syria, you're born in Iran. Or you're born in any of these countries are sanctioned. You're completely off. Even you forget even getting on one of these crypto platforms just because of where you're born. The one thing that you have no control in your life actually can actually block you from many of the activities. You know, I come. I'm, I have Armenian background. I come from a family of immigrants that was killed in the genocide 100 years ago. Five generations were each born in different countries. And you know, when I see people that are just happen to be born in Lebanon, for example, born in Syria, and they're not able to access the ecosystem, ironically. In countries, they probably deserve the most to have access to some of these uh, currencies. It bothers me. So I think uh, the good is when they're in the ecosystem, then they can operate freely. But I think this is one thing that is, I think, conception in what you mentioned is, is obviously very, uh, very uh, important. And actually, I have to say, one of the beauty we see in the crypto space in the last four or five years is some of the most in incredible innovations happening, have been happening in parts of the world that you would not have seen otherwise. Because these guys now, they just need internet access. They're able to come up, code. And, and you're seeing from parts of India, parts of Russia, from parts of the Middle East, great innovation coming up that otherwise you have not have seen it. I think that's kind of the equalizer from that perspective. Now, when it comes to um, currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum, like, you know, I mean, looking at Bitcoin, for example, right, it's happening with El Salvador, for example. You know, what if we're seeing more and more people, countries now that say decide to use Bitcoin as legal tender, for example? What is going to happen? I think it was, for me, very telling uh, when, 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 when the, uh, the El Salvador came, news, uh, came about the first, I thought about two things. One of them is the banks in El Salvador right now are getting calls from their correspondent banks in the US who for sure are not happy. And they're going to raise the same questions of money laundering, blah, 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 compliance, which frankly, uh, I mean, it show, just so, it shows a, a lack of knowledge of the crypto space. Second, it was what is the World Bank and the IMF going to do? Actually, not far from uh, Australia, we had the, the, the Marshall Islands about last uh, couple, two years ago now, they came up with the idea of the SOV, which is their own decentralized currency. Again, the Marshall Islands is a very small country, 50,000 people. Uh, frankly, the, it's, um, it's a very small economy. The majority of the economy actually is, is actually out of grants. And actually, as soon as they announced that plan of decentralized currency, they had very strong pressure from the US and the IMF to back away. Actually, I was reading recently the IMF report on the country that came out in April, of the, uh, the two, two, three months ago. And basically, they actually warned the country that pursuing that uh, will potentially cause financial stability. 
What happened with El Salvador, a great, great example, the World Bank basically refusing to provide technical assistance uh, to El Salvador, uh, claiming environmental questions and transparency and saying that it could create some legal, uh, financial and macroeconomic uh, risks, which I think is a bit, um, frankly, a bit dishonest when you have a country that is really is, has 25% of its population in extreme poverty, 70% of its population is unbanked. Uh, it's actually, it was so bad the managing its currency that has to pay, it's a, it's a dollarized economy. It's actually one of the few countries along with, uh, with Ecuador, Palau, you know, and Timor-Leste that actually uses the US dollar as its, uh, as a, as a, as its home currency. Uh, it, everything that they tried over the last 20, 30 years didn't work. The country is actually willing to experiment and actually some of these international organizations are not supporting the country. Again, I think it's a, it's a very, um, you know, it makes you reflect on some of the, the, the vested interests that happen in, the, in that case. And I think uh, it is what it is, but it comes back to your point, Nitin, of what is that tectonic uh, conflicts that we may see over the next couple of months because of developments, not only with DeFi, but also some announcements like uh, uh, the El Salvador news. Henry, well. that, the, the big development for me is, is this, um, is Salinas in, in Mexico. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's a billionaire. He's, you know, he's a very, very smart guy. He's done really well. I mean, he, he runs the, he's the founder chairman of, of, the, of the Grupo Salinas. I mean, yep. he's worth about 16, 17 billion US that, the, 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 that they know about, right? And I mean, he's now working with his bank at Zeca to, to accept Bitcoin. I think Mexico is not a small place. It's a very powerful country. It's a proper industrial heartland. Like that could be a real game changer as well. Yeah, I think for many things, uh, for banks in countries like Mexico, like, for example, there's a lot of remittances, right? I mean, it's a no-brainer to use uh, some of this, let's say, even forget even Bitcoin, use stable coins uh, just for remittances. Today, Mark, what bothers me as well is that the average fee for sending money cross-border is 7% average. And by the way, this, is, this data is actually skewed because in the G G8, it's actually less than 2%. So mm -hmm. it's actually more than double, du double digit around the world. Uh, so think about if you're sending money from Australia to India to Latin America and all the fees that are incurred. First of all, don't even talk about the terrible user experience that it is, but I mean, just the sending it. Think about a country like Mexico and the US, the number of volumes or remittances take place, how that can, that can be a, a big difference. Uh, but also, if you think about countries who are looking at um, addressing financial services, addressing financial inclusion, and the ar argument that is always given is, uh, is there a lot of criminal activity and so on and so forth in Bitcoin? You know, the one piece of advice I give to everybody is, if you want to buy drugs, you want to launder money, you want to do something illegal, do not use Bitcoin. You will get caught. Uh, the best way, if you want to do it, is good, good, good use your good old cash, which is the most private way of payment right now. And actually, this is why we've seen the the pipeline uh, hack the other day. The, uh, you know, the funds were obviously being recouped last summer with a Twitter hack. Uh, less than a week later, they're able to find who it was because these guys are using Bitcoin. And actually, the irony of all this is, I find today despite all the billions of dollars spent every year in money laundering efforts, for example. All of you that have opened an account, you know the very painful process of the documentation and all these things that we give, frankly, which is a bit useless. According to the, according to the World Bank today, despite all the efforts that we do every year, between two to 5% of global GDP is being laundered. That's 800 billion to $2 trillion. And we're able to capture less than one to 2% of laundered transactions. <laughs> So again, when we've tried to put pressure on these banks saying, oh, no, no, we're worried about criminal activity. Last year, according to data we have, this is actual on-chain data, right? Less than 0.34%, 0.34% of crypto transactions were linked to illicit, illicit activities. Yeah. Half of that, by the way, are Ponzi schemes. This is like the good old uh, grandma selling like Tupperware and stuff like that. It's, a, it's a, Half of it is like Ponzi schemes. It's nothing to do with crypto. It just happens it's happening in crypto space. Yeah. But again, I think there's way less criminal activity people think in crypto. Ironically, I believe the financial stability and uh, there'll be less criminal activity if countries and financial institutions are going on crypto because of traceability issues. Now, that raises other privacy concerns. Actually, another big thing we didn't discuss today was central bank digital currencies. One of the big benefits of that is actually governments will be able to monitor transactions, again, depending on which model that is, that is being enacted. Um, but again, I think one of the big questions we're going to have over the coming years is actually not whether Bitcoin is used by criminals or not, or uh, CBDCs are used by criminals. First of all, with CBDCs, pretty much corruption with money becomes pretty much impossible. You know, if I want to corrupt Derek, uh, I cannot send him like $100,000 of CBDC, I'll get flagged in two seconds. Um, yes, I can, you know, you can put people, kids into Harvard, send them a bottle of wine, give them nice watches, but human corruption will exist as we always does, but at least by money, it will be pretty much impossible. Uh, and I think what's going to be uh, interesting, a debate will shift on privacy was, okay, 
today, maybe I like using cash because nobody knows what I'm doing with my payments. I run it in the banking system. It's probably more opaque with the whole network we have of you know shell companies and country sovereignty, so on and so forth, that actually one of the obstacles, ironically, I think of the crypto industry, maybe it's transparency. Now, people will say, hey, 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 I, I actually, is, I, I don't want to have this too much transparency. I want to go back to things that are a bit more private. Great mm-hmm. example is the ECB, the European Central Bank, came up with a report about a month and a half ago that showed that Europeans, in particular Germans, by the way, for reasons that I ignore, uh, rather have less functionalities, less convenience, uh, and they prefer having privacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I can tell this is different in countries like China, for example, you know, that's the exact opposite. So I think that's, that's where society, cultural elements, along with legal elements, as well as policy elements will come and interact. I think Nitin comes back to one of the questions you had initially. Come, it's going to become one of these more systemic shifts that we'll have over the next couple of years. I think that's very, very interesting to watch. Mm. Can I ask a question around um, around DeFi again? I, I noticed just last week, um, Anderson and Harowitz um, noted that they were going to invest, uh, raise $2.2 billion in a fund. Yeah. It's a serious size fund now uh, yeah. for this space, very large, um, with the intention of targeting that investment into decentralized finance. Um, Where is that money going to go? In other words, how do you think the impact is going to be for um, DeFi um, positive? Uh, are we going to see uh, more growth in that space or are we going to see just overinflated prices? What do you think in regards to that sort of uh, money going into that space? Yeah, good, good question, Derek. Again, by your background to everybody, like, yeah, Anderson Horowitz announced it's, I think it's his third fund now, but it's like that's $2.2 billion fund that invests in four verticals, one of them being uh, DeFi. The other one, I think, is Web3. The other one, I think, is future payments. I think the other vertical they invest in is um, creators. So how you create a creator community on on and monetize that. But DeFi is obviously one of the areas they're extremely bullish on. Uh, frankly, I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know how tomorrow morning, if you gave me $2.2 billion, I don't know how I would deploy that, to be honest. It's a lot of capital uh, uh, in the space. Um, how they're going to deploy, I think it's going to be very interesting. I think that when it comes back also is, yes, there's DeFi projects going on. But also when we often uh, don't talk a lot about as well, there's obviously a lot of these DeFi coins, you know, that uh, exist, you know, uh, many of these, whether it's Sushi, Union, so on and so forth. Um, what often I think investors, the mistake they make is that when you look at this particular coins, many of them are very different features. For example, some of these coins only give you governance access. They're not linked to the performance of the network, for example. And actually there's ways where you, in DeFi platforms, uh, where, where you, when you're staking, for example, or you're getting involved in the platform, there's ways you can actually generate, let's say yield or revenues. Uh, but it's not, um, each one of these DeFi platforms has different uh, particularities. I think that worth exploring a bit further more. So I think in general, it's gonna be very positive for DeFi. How they're gonna deploy that capital, I don't know. I think they have a, quite a couple of years to do so. But again, for me, what was interesting is actually some of these big rounds that we are seeing is who's investing in them. So, I mean, just the same week we had, for example, a company like Chain Analysis uh, that raised a, a traceability solution, raised $100 million at a $4.2 billion valuation. Yes, it was, it was, it was led by Code 2, but I think what was interesting in there, you have sovereign wealth funds are investing, you have many institutional investors are investing. And again, uh, obviously these guys put big tickets. We could argue all day whether these valuations are justified or not. Uh, but again, I think that the, the, uh, what's really interesting for me is that you're having these institutional investors putting pretty sizable tickets. And for a lot of them, it'll be great way to learn about the industry. And by the way, in the same way that we saw in the other industries in the next last 10, 20 years, there's a great way to allocate to a fund like this, to allocate some of these big companies and they learn about it. And I guess that that's just the beginning for them of their journey of investing in crypto. Uh, and that also includes DeFi. So again, I think all these signs are very positive for the industry. I have to say, um, we're going to look back in a couple of years at kind of sessions like today, you know, what like you know, we'll say, oh, when Portal organized this event, we were, we were talking about DeFi, the early days. We're going to laugh at it, actually, thinking, oh, we're so naive. It was such early days. I often think about people when they used to discuss the internet in the 1990s or when Amazon listed, like, yeah, at the beginning of your presentation, you know, and some of the conversations people must have had, uh, you know, and I think it's going to be very interesting. We're going to look back. With, that's what we should record these sessions and look back and either say, man, we were so naive. We were not thinking big enough. Well, actually, we all knew it was going to happen. And uh, it was just, you know, we were just good at predicting the future. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what's happening in the next couple of years. And, and one thing is brilliant on, on what you mentioned, uh, you know, Henry, is this, right? That if you look at the traditional VC investment, which was long-term, 10-year returns, I think DeFi and crypto has changed that too, in the sense that now you have a model which is part token, part equity, pre-series, pre-seed, series A, plus token, 
based models where you are going with semi-liquid investments. And I think if you look at including, you know, some of the examples you gave, you also have the drive from institutional investors from things like custodians, uh, the, the, the straight jacket custodians, the market data providers. Kiko has recently raised 30 million, which would be unthinkable back in the day. So I think it's it's not just changing the way finance is done, it's also changing the way VCs are going after this long short model all coupled into this sort of you know structure, which I think is super interesting, especially from a VC perspective. This is pure investing into equity, also an equity plus token model, which I think is an interesting model how these companies are raising funds that they're raising pre-seed and pre-series A, but then the turnaround issues them tokens too, which not only dilutes the the overall market cap, but also allows them allows some of these entities to be able to, um, you know, convert that into into a different kind of equity that's tradable yeah. in, in short term. I think it's fascinating. But see, that sure. raises the issue as well because often when we think about an old investing perspective. A lot of these companies are getting VC money, but then they're issuing tokens. So then, yeah. where is the value creation? Isn't there conflicts of interest between one area yeah. where your goal is to generate return for your investor? You know, it's the value that you're giving to shareholders. Yeah. You know, good old uh, corporate finance principles. And also the other thing, you have tokens. Where is the value? Actually, I've been I've been personally critical of some companies that are raising VC money, but then also at the same time uh, uh, launching tokens. Because I think yeah. there's, there's an inherent uh, potential, maybe not inherent, but a potential conflict potential. of interest there that is not being discussed, I think, enough in the um, in the in the crypto ecosystem. The second thing I think you mentioned, Itin, is some of the, I think the biggest opportunity I see in the crypto space now is the boring businesses. Uh, you mentioned before, let's say, fund admins, uh, uh, custodians. Uh, yeah. Today, actually, it's very difficult. You know, when you talk about fund administrators, uh, like, you know, how you strike a daily nap, extremely difficult. Many of the fund admins, the biggest ones in the world, um, yeah, they can actually uh, uh, strike a nap use if you're buying spot Bitcoin. Uh, good luck doing it when you're trading derivatives, for example. You know, uh, okay. it's very difficult. And I mean, I'm, I'm actually surprised how the industry has caught up. The auditors, a very good example. You know, it's very difficult to get a big for auditor to go audit the fund today. You know, uh, and I'm not even talking about DeFi. Forget about DeFi. I mean, we're, nobody's there yet. Yeah, you know. So I mean, I think it's. Been, I've been shocked how much the traditional ecosystem has has not been caught up. Even custody, right? I mean, think about the custody space. I think has done a lot of progress the last 12 months. Uh, but man, we still have a lot of way to go. So I think while a lot of these VCs are investing in DeFi and very cutting edge areas, I actually think there's massive opportunities. It's a boring. Actually, the most boring business in crypto. Uh, where you know you can, it's it's recurring revenues. It's not sexy. It doesn't get you on panels. Uh, you know, doesn't make uh, doesn't make the headlines of news. But they're very good businesses, uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunities in these things as well. No, no, absolutely. I've met a few insurance companies, uh, Henry, where yeah, insurance. unknown, unheard of, who are offering insurance these because they need insurance to do business. And if you look at the risk, the risk metric is not very low. The traditional companies don't offer insurance because simply they don't get the risk metrics or risk model frameworks. Yeah. In the absence of the risk model, you have smaller companies stepping in saying, you know what, there's little, really no risk in this case. Right. I'll provide insurance so you can move on with your business. And that had not existed before. So I think you're, you're spot on there. It's like boring businesses have suddenly become more fun uh, because some of the things that crypto is doing to it. Yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting to see. The big problem I think many crypto companies are having right now is how do you find talent as well? It's obviously uh, very difficult to hire people with crypto expertise, as you know. Uh, and I think what's going to be interesting over next, I think it gives a lot of opportunities to, uh, you know, when I see a lot of young people, uh, you know, if, if this is a great area where literally if you want to work for a crypto company today, and even, even the boring crypto companies, right? Literally, the only thing people want is your passion, if you're interested in it. Mm -hmm. And they will give you this opportunity. It's the only industry where people literally don't hire on CVs. Even when I hire for my own crypto team, I honestly don't know. I don't care about the CVs. I, I talk to them about crypto. I say how much they want. I say how passionate they are. I ask about what crypto they own. Uh, you know what they follow. And that for me is a bigger indicator. I think this is a great opportunity for young people. Mm -hmm. You're coming in. You know, it's a it's a level playing field. And by the way, industries as well. You, you guys are portal a great example, right? Of a fund to fund that's coming in a brand new industry, and that gives you really a whole new set of opportunities that are going to open up in the next couple of years. So when it comes back at the beginning of the session, I said this is the most exciting time in the history of money and history of finance. This is a great example of what it is. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to, again, I think we're going to look back at this as well in a decade or two and say, man, can you imagine the time where the, the crypto uh, hedge fund industry was $2.8 billion? I remember actually when I did one of my first slides at PwC, I had a slide that says, today the crypto, um, uh, crypto asset market cap is growing rapidly and has reached $26 billion. I mean, think about it. You know, yeah. I mean... <laughs> There's a uh, multiple times of Bitcoin that is traded today. Today, so again, we're gonna have a look back at some of these talks we're having right now and laugh about it in a couple of years. If if if, if it reaches, <clears throat> I mean, the gold gold market cap is now I think eleven trillion. Trillion. Yeah. Cryptos call it just over one. So I mean, if you had to 
you know, to normalize the two in the next five years, there's still 10x growth as so the yeah, most exactly. bearish case scenario. Exactly. Do you, um, you know, a, a, new, a new sort of nascent sector of the industry that's emerging is, is NFTs. Yep. And we had um, Chris Schlotlicker from Superworld on a while back. It was really interesting in just trying to get your head around the applications, not just for, for digital assets, but for real world assets to be tokenized, to be fractionated. You know, there's Chili's, which is, you know, <clears throat> provides access to some of the sports teams and it's like, you know, virtual cards. People really seem to be, to be participating. Do you, do you have any sort of thoughts on, 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 on that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think uh, uh, NFTs are very, very interesting. Again, uh, uh, and their growth has been very fascinating as well, Mark. Again, to put things in perspective, in uh, January 1, 2020, uh, so about 18 months ago, uh, th there was less than 25,000 weekly users on NFT platforms, non-fungible token platforms. Uh, last quarter, there was over half a million weekly active users on these platforms. So really, the, uh, the, the retail interest and adoption of NFTs has been really, uh, I would say, incredible. There's been a couple of catalysts on this. The big one, I think, was NBA Top Shots that brought a lot of people within the ecosystem. And as well, the whole rise of crypto, the art market, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it provides a lot of opportunities on NFTs. I'm very bullish on NFTs. Um, on a couple of things, first of all, on areas that frankly deserve to be disintermediated. I mean, the art world is a great example today where you have these big auction houses and galleries where the price is so opaque, there's no transparency. And frankly, artists are often paying the price. They're, they're held the hostage by these galleries. You know, uh, I just recently bought a, an NFT of an Armenian artist, for example. I think it was the first NFT actually by an Armenian artist. And if the day I sell that NFT, the artist forever gets 7.5% of my resale price, right? It's a great way to actually give kind of these intermediate, these intermediaries that were in, involved in the process. The one area I'm even more bullish on NFTs is actually, again, the boring areas. I think areas like land titles, real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm shocked of how many lawyers today make a living out of conveyancing or in civil law countries with notaries. I think it's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, literally something that we can easily solve using NFTs or in blockchain technology. We have, you go see a lawyer who has to verify your title is clean and make sure you can buy and sell that, especially in many emerging markets, by the way, where they, we don't have land titles. The new government changes, the government mortgage records got erased or changed. I, I'm very bullish on what's going to happen on NFTs. Again, on the non-sexy stuff. Land titles is one, for example, and other things, you know, like documentation, birth certificates and stuff like that. If you think about it, there's no reason why my birth certificate, I have two young kids, is on a stupid piece of paper with a stamp on it, not on an NFT, for example, right? Or a piece of art, uh, Mark, I want to sell you something. I, I, can, I can, you see the have it, I transfer it to you, have it. When it comes to, trace, to tra traceability, transparency and liquidity, it provides a lot of opportunities on that perspective. Um, the one thing that I'm watching right now, I think uh, on the, I think it was going to be very interesting. Let's say the the big painting that was sold the uh, the from Beeple, the six nine million dollar painting that was sold, that is a digital native file, right? It's a digital native piece of art. Yeah. That piece can be easily tokenized right now to let's say a hundred thousand pieces, right? I cannot go buy myself a six nine million dollar NFT, but I can maybe go buy the one hundred thousand piece of it. And when that painting gets sold, I automatically get my share automatically just via smart contracts. You know, so I think there's a lot of the benefits that we're going to see in there. I think we're just a tip of it. Uh, I think a bit like we had the ICO boom in 2017. There was a lot of fluff. Obviously, there was a crash, but then we saw amazing projects come out of it. Same thing will happen with NFTs. Yeah, there's a lot of hoopla, hoopla, uh, you know, from uh, people buying like, uh, you know, uh, all these different kinds of NFTs. But I think NFTs are definitely here to stay. It opens up a whole new world of opportunities. You know, it's funny because now we talk about crypto. And in the same crypto session, we can talk about CBDCs, NFTs, fund management. I think in one or two years, it'll be impossible. We'll have, you know, fund managers only focus on NFTs. We'll be just yeah. investing in that. People will just think the industry is maturing so much. It was the same way, by the way, when I started talking about fintech a couple of years ago, in the same panel, we talk about robo-advisors, about payments, uh, about what's happening with insure tech and rec tech. And now each one of them is a vertical on its own. Uh, I think same thing we'll see in the crypto space. I think NFTs will be one that will go branch out on its own as well. I don't know if there's any other questions from, from any members of the audience. Um, we've, we, we've covered quite a broad range of, of, of topics. I'm kind of a bit conscious of time. Um, I know you, you're, not, yep. you, you're not going anywhere soon. But, yeah. um, but, but thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. I think for a lot of people who want to keep in touch, you know, obviously you mentioned before on my LinkedIn, I have my 60 second uh, video every week. Uh, so for those of you interested, want to keep on track. I'm actually film recording one right after this. Uh, so I'm, I'm from a hotel quarantine, but also I have a weekly newsletter on Sundays called The Future of Money, where I share three big ideas that I think people need to know 
uh, that comes out. And also, I think for those who want to learn more, uh, I put a lot of uh, time and energy and investment into educational videos. So uh, you have now on my YouTube page, a lot of educational videos on YouTube. And also, uh, I really want to make sure that it's shared with most people around the world. All my videos now are available, also not only in English, uh, but also in French, Arabic, and Chinese. And I can tell you in scoop, I'm going to launch Spanish in a couple of weeks uh, following the El Salvador news and uh, the big interest in, in Latin America. Uh, so again, uh, there's a lot of educational content there. Uh, one piece of advice, I think, for everybody, this education is the most important topic in this area. You know, you may love Bitcoin, you may hate it. You may love cryptocurrencies, you may hate it. You may believe it's a bubble. You may believe it's the future of money. But I think understanding what it means and what's happening in the space is critical, uh, especially if this is an area you're involved in. I would agree. And I think there's too much focus on Bitcoin, which you know we, we tend to call the gateway. It's like it's not Bitcoin. The story around crypto is not Bitcoin. The story around crypto is, is the applications you're going to see going forward that are going to change the way that, that capital and factors of production are, are aligned exactly. and, and get rid of jobs that are sort of boring, repetitive, in some cases, just, you know, like tracking money, things like that. I think banks, to an extent, could just become portals for AML and KYC work. That's pretty much it. What, what else would you need to, because you're, you're, the difference is, as you know, you know, when you hold crypto, right now that you put money in a bank, the bank owns that money. You actually don't own it. You think you do, but if you wake up in Cyprus, as they did a few years ago, you realize that you don't own Lebanon that. last last year. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. With crypto on your phone, it's your money. You own it. You don't owe anyone anything. No one owes you anything. It, 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 there's no there's no master slave relationship. And I think you know with cell phone penetration where it is broadband, um, you know the the the, the connectivity, etc. I think it's going to just sort of, especially in developing countries, like you you mentioned transferring money to transfer money to some of the more impoverished countries, like if you had to try to transfer money from here to Zimbabwe, it costs you 30%. From Australia to Zimbabwe, it's 30%. I mean, that, that, those rips are unacceptable when it can be done for nothing if someone's got the same sort of, you know, setup. Okay. Absolutely. I think so this is why I'm very bullish. I think the, 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 the empowering role it can have, financial inclusion is one. Uh, you know, I mean, just El Salvador, uh, yeah, two days ago, uh, at the time of the recording, you know, the uh, president gave, anybody who downloads the wallet will get $30 in Bitcoin. Mm. Right, there's about 117 million of Bitcoin that will be given out. So, get empowering people, right? Uh, 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 Cross border fees, I think, are completely unacceptable. I think in 2021, it's a shame that we're still having people. And by the way, the people are paying the price, are those that can afford it the least. Yeah. It's, it's a massive failure of the banking system. I think it's in the whole, I think it's unacceptable. Um, I think what's also uh, on the uh, central bank uh, money, you absolutely, like you said today, there's two kinds of central bank money. One is like uh, good old banknotes, which is liability on the central bank. Second, are the reserves that your bank holds at the central bank. The money that you have in your bank account is not central bank money. It's literally a liability. It's a plus or minuses or accounting entries on the book of that bank. So I think our generation, everybody on this call, we're going to see a third form of central bank money. I think that's going to be very, very exciting uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from that perspective. And also, I think uh, financial empowerment. What happened in Zimbabwe? You know, what happened in Lebanon? You know, uh, what happening is, uh, in Venezuela? What's happening in many countries in the emerging market. Again, we don't think about this when you're in Australia, where obviously the Reserve Bank in Australia is very good, is very capable. You don't think about this when you're in the UK and the US, you know. Uh, but I think uh, it's a very, we often do not think about the people who actually are getting, you know, these, these are realities, you know. Mm -hmm. Lebanon is such a good example that we may, we're seeing catastrophic collapse of the economy. Again, because people have their money in the bank, people have saved all their life, they're not able to get their money out because of the fractional banking system that we have. I think that's, again, we have to give, we, sh we should not get rid of banks, but I think we have to give people an option. We have to give people a choice. I think that's the beauty, I think, with, uh, with uh, crypto and uh, frankly, even DeFi provides. Mm. I mean, today, as a retail user, I'm able to get uh, you know, 8, 9, 10% yield on these platforms, right? Uh, obviously, it's way better than I can get in the bank. For example. Of course, it's a different risk profile. There's counterparty risk. But at least people have the choice to make a decision. I think that's very, very important from that perspective. You're right. And I think banks, the main thing is banks have to be held accountable. They always seem boring, but yet they take so much excessive risk by passing the risk on to, 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 um, to investors and consumers. People also don't seem to really understand the concept that the majority of central banks are privately owned. They're not actually working for the government. They are privately owned. They issue money based on what they perceive is the right thing to do. They don't have the general population's best interests, in, in my opinion. That Salina said it quite clearly in the interview. If you go to the website, if you just look up the, the, the link that I'll provide for you, He's in a video there and he explains quite clearly why he sees fiat is fraud. That's his, his sort of touchline. He goes, look, fiat at this point is fraud. The amount of currency being printed 
it's, it, it, it can only end in tears. This is the biggest monetary policy experiment in the history of, 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 of humanity. And no one really knows, we're in uncharted waters. No one really knows how it ends. But at some point you have to take, you have to take the juice away. And, and what's gonna happen when that liquidity is pulled? <clears throat> what, what is gonna be the store of value? Yeah, the bigger question, but I think you're right. There's gonna be a lot of debates with central banks. 86% of central banks right now are looking at CBDC. Yeah. Uh, I think as you saw, uh, the uh, the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank is live. The Bahamas is live with Project Sense. China is, I mean, pretty much years ahead of everybody else. So I think it's going to be very interesting. The big debate that I'm watching on CBDC is privacy. Uh, today, again, central banks with CBDCs will have a lot of visibility on transactions. Uh, frankly, it gives them a lot of more economic uh, monitoring capabilities, which could be, argued, could be argued is good from a policy perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's some other benefits. For example, it puts an end to black economy, tax evasion, corruption. I think well, all these things with CBDC will be very difficult. To, uh, be very difficult to tax evasion. You know, countries today like Greece and Italy, up to 20 up to 30 percent of payments are still made in cash. Why? Of course, it helps if you don't want to pay tax. If you're running a restaurant on a Greek island, why would you bother? The, uh, you're taking anything else but cash, for example, right? I mean, this is not a surprise. We all know this and we all experiment this every day. Uh, so I think what's going to be interesting is that the big thing I'm watching right now is a privacy. I think I would not be surprised this becomes a political, we'll have elections where one of the, the, the debates at a, at a presidential or prime minister elections will be what, how, as a society, how much privacy we want on payments and how much visibility you want to give to a central bank. It's very interesting. I can tell in my next book, actually, I have about 100 pages on this topic. Different models are being explored right now from central banks. What is the model? Uh, are you letting the central bank see the retail payments? Are you just letting them see the wholesale payments? Mm. Uh, massive design decisions. But unfortunately, these are not technical issues. These are not monetary issues or economics issues. These are, again, policy issues as well. I think the interaction of this will be the first time that central banks will need to deal with these issues in many, many years. So it'll be very interesting to watch. Mm. And I think the, the other interesting thing is that, you know, we're taking a snapshot and we're looking at the future. And, and we are who we are at our age and where we are in society at this given time. But what's intriguing is looking at the demographics coming through, isn't it, Henry? You know, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, you know, these are guys that are, that are at birth, they were given a, an iPad to play with and, and, you know, they're digital natives from start. How will they react? To, to this industry that's coming forward? And what will they look at in the rear vision mirror at what we used to do as banking? Yeah, good question, Gary. And I get this with all my students. So, you know, it's very interesting. I have the, you know, that's what I love teaching is that keeps me really well with the young population and uh, a lot of my students. And, you know, when I ask my students, first of all, when I ask my students what's the most valuable asset they own, you know what often they tell me? It's in video game assets. You know, this is why NFTs become very, very important with video game assets people have. But second is obviously the that's completely you know, uh, uh, very comfortable digital assets. You know, I often tell a lot of, when I meet a lot of executives, uh, bank executives, they tell me, oh, this Bitcoin thing, what do you think? You know, they, and what I tell them is two things. Uh, uh, go at the next family dinner, family Zoom, whatever you're doing, ask the youngest member of your family what he or she thinks about Bitcoin. You'll be surprised at their answer. Second is in your organization. If your bank CEO and all your executives are which you have are, are old school, they're not going to know about this. So what I tell them is go ask the young, the intern you have, the youngest people in your organization, you'll be surprised how knowledgeable they are on crypto. I can tell yeah. you at PwC, some of the best people we hired on crypto are literally out of university. They've never worked in big firms, but they're very into crypto. They're very comfortable with digital assets as well. I can tell you, I know a lot of young people now, they live their entire life on crypto. They get paid a whatever fiat salary, immediately they convert it to crypto. Their savings are all on DeFi platforms or generating yield, uh, or they're using some of these credit cards that are linked to crypto. I mean, they live their entire life in the crypto ecosystem, you know? Uh, I can tell you myself, now whenever I have to make cross-border payments, I try to pay in stable coins. You know, recently I had to make a payment from my HSBC, uh, sorry, from my bank, no, it's HSBC, now you guys know, on, on, a, on, a, on a Sunday to Canada. My bank doesn't do FX payments on a Sunday and doesn't do cross-border payments on a Sunday. I don't know, maybe my bank goes to church. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's unacceptable in 2021. We're not able to do these basic things. What did I do? I said stable coins. My sister was able to get it immediately. It, I, I actually don't think that money will leave the crypto ecosystem anyways. But again, the very good example of how we can improve things. So I think it's very excited about the future. And again, for a lot of young people as well. Uh, I think it's very easy when we talk about older people. Ah, yeah, these young guys and this and that. Think about tokenization. You know, one of the big problems you have across the world, including in Australia, is access to the real estate market where the average person now is very difficult in Sydney or Melbourne, talking about where I'm in Hong Kong. It's impossible. That was, by the way, one of the reasons we had some of the events we had the one or two years ago in Hong Kong. It's impossible today for the average worker to buy real estate. Impossible. 
unless you are lucky and you have wealthy parents, it's pretty much impossible. Tokenization enables these guys, okay, we can maybe they don't cannot have the down payment for a building, but maybe they can get at least their exposure, get on the real estate ladder, right? And we own this to the young people. I think we have a policy perspective. What we are doing today, all these conversations, everything we're doing in that now, we're not necessarily doing it for us. We're doing for you know the five-year-old today who deserves probably a better financial ecosystem. I think that's what he should actually motivate a lot of us who are actually looking at this area and actually uh, driving a lot of activity in the sector. So thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure being with you all. It was really a, a, an honor. Thanks for having me uh, on Alan. Look forward to staying in touch. Well, yeah, well Henry, thanks. thank you tremendously for your for your for, your, for attending. Um, so for those that want to um, follow Henry in the um, comment section there, there's links and other things that Henry's put in. Um, Henry's 60 seconds and Henry's um, uh, has nearly half a million people following him on LinkedIn. Really interesting, up-to-date information, worthwhile following. Yeah, thanks, thanks, um, Derek. Thanks, Henry. It was really good catching up. Um, good to see you're in good spirits. You know, keep, keep, keep your head up. Only a few more days left. Um, thanks for your insights. It's always really good. It would be great to catch up with you maybe towards the end of the year and review, <clears throat> see if the um, if some of the things we spoke about today have played out. You know, may, may, maybe in quarter four this year, we could have another chat. I really enjoyed okay. it. I love to a broad generalist view. Likewise, Henry, it was really good. And I, I love your energy. I speak a lot too, but that was amazing for like an hour and a half. So, that's, so thank you for that. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you. Good on you, Henry. Thank you. Take care, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, Henry.